I, I'm not really like a a person who believes in um, like miracles, things like that. Um, but I was so I was on a plane um, to Argentina. Um, so long story short, I, I had, after the restaurant industry, I'd found myself in a sales job and um, pretty toxic environment where um, it was very money driven, very um, greed driven, um, which for the state that I was in, I was like, I thrived in that environment, but I became, um, I became such a big asshole mm. um, and very far from the moral compass that I had growing up. Um, but in any case, I was... Um, on a plane to Argentina, and um, for for this um, um, trip that was it was kind of unexpected, but it was it was like a last minute whim thing, and I I decided to go. And um, so I'm sitting on a plane. This is my first international trip, and I had a fear of flying, and I was still at that point a pack a day smoker mm. and a drinker and um, was very, very anxious because I didn't know how I was gonna survive this 12-hour flight to Argentina. And um, so my plan was I was gonna like pop on some uh, nicotine patches, chew some gum, um, maybe- For 12 uh, hours. For 12 <laughs> hours. Um, maybe like take a couple of, um, of uh, like sleeping pills, drink a gin and tonic and Wake up in Argentina. Hopefully pass out, yeah. <laughs> right? So that was my, my grand plan at the time. <laughs> and uh, I it was like one of those kind of like um, just rare events where you're on a plane that's not very full. And I had a whole row to myself. Mm. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, I'm just going to like lay down and pass out. So I'm like, you know, the plane's getting ready to take off. And I start to like, you know, close my eyes. And I look over across the aisle and there's this older gentleman that's sitting over there. And he looks over at me and, you know, I nod, you know, kind of obligatory nod. And uh, he nods back and then, you know, I, I start to settle in and close my eyes. And the next thing I hear, so what's taking you to Argentina? <laughs> like and I was like, no. ah, damn it. <laughs> this is like the last thing that I want right now. I like, I don't want to talk to this guy. But, you know, I had enough like Midwest sensibility that I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engage and be polite. And um, four hours later, we're still talking. Oh, wow. And this gentleman proceeds to uh, tell me about his life. And the fact that he had lost his mother to suicide and he had lived, um, grew up in poverty like I had. Um, he lived with anxiety and depression and he had been a drinker and a smoker and that now his life was completely different. And I don't know what compelled him to share this with me. I don't know if he just saw something in me and he sensed that I... I needed to hear it. Um, I don't know if he just needed to get some stuff off of his chest. Um, I, you know, I still don't know to this day. Um, but it was one of those experiences where, um, I mean, he did just spoke to my heart in a way, like in this like deep down vibratory level, you know. And I, I just, a, I, I, I started to understand that I wasn't alone. Like I felt so desperately alone all the time and, and just knowing that there was someone else out there who had been through some similar experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and that, come out the other side. And come out on the other side, yeah. That, that was huge. And then to see that you know, this person was um, living a life where they, they seemed to be happy. They seemed to be thriving. And it just it gave me so much hope and it made me understand that like, I had to make some serious changes in my life. And so I don't know. I mean, we, you know, we didn't exchange information. We didn't, mm. we don't keep in contact or anything like that. It was one of those like one time things. We talked on the plane and that was it. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't like, I don't believe in angels. I don't, you know, but it was like, it was one of those situations that I'm like, gosh, that was like, that was 
unworldly, yeah. you know? Um, and so that was really the catalyst for understanding that not only was change possible, but I think most importantly that I had a personal responsibility to make that change, you know? And that, that really, that was the beginning of everything. So what did you start doing from there? Well, um, I, I think like, first of all, it, it, it changed my perspective going down to Argentina and going down there, I started to think about things differently and understand that the, the lifestyle that I had, um, because despite, you know, doing poorly in school and despite not having a college degree, I, I managed some success in sales and, you know, I had, um, I had all the stuff in Chicago. I had the condo and the car and, you know, all that, um, still wasn't happy. Mm. Um, but you know, I realized that my priorities were completely out of whack. And so, you know, being in Argentina was cool because I, um, was introduced to this culture where people, you know, work hard and, and, you know, um, but they, they like take time in the afternoon and they go to a park and they drink mate and they eat alfajores and they hang out and, you know, they eat dinner late and they go out and they have this like friend circle and they're, you know, there's this different lifestyle mm -hmm. that I, you know, didn't have in my, my work a day life, you know? And so that was, that was part of it is just understanding like there's, there's a different way to live and it doesn't have to be that way, you know? Um, while I was down there, I, um, I took a lot of excursions and a lot of hikes. And so getting out into the world, out into nature was very centering for me, very balancing. You know, um, I think nature therapy is a very real thing. Oh, I'm, I believe it hundred yeah. percent. So, um, so that experience was really, you know, kind of what got the ball rolling. Um, now, you know, keep in mind during this time, I was still taking pharmaceuticals. So, you know, that was um, part of the treatment plan. And so, you know, you know, like, like I say, those, those are great tools, you know, and I, I'm not suggesting to anybody that they should like stop just taking their meds or anything like that. Um, that's a very personal choice and one that you should make with your doctor. Um, so, but for me, um, I always knew that um, the pharmaceuticals, the side effects were, um, were just did not work well with my body and that there was a different way, a different approach. So, um, it, it kind of became this research type thing where I, I started digging in, um, checking out, um, you know, what other people were doing and just seeing what alternatives there were. You know, um, I was very fortunate to find a therapist who um, very much believed in a holistic approach to mental health. And so um, that helped to kind of start to understand that there were there were some alternative ways to, mm -hmm. to deal with this. Um, but I would say the majority of it came through connecting with people online. Um, at the time, um, this was, um, you know, early 2000s. Um, MySpace? Well, so <laughs> MySpace and then Facebook were okay. really my like big outlets uh -huh. where I was started to connect with people and connect with these like at the time, like very small groups of people who were starting to share about this. And um, it was so cool. It was such an exciting time because, um, you know, the no one in the world was talking about this. Um, but, you know, in this, this kind of secret society, the secret club, yeah. we started like talking about mental yeah. health and like best practices and what we did. And, you know, and, and it was, it was exciting, you know, and I, um, really started to build up my confidence and, um, and started sharing my story more with people. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, um, just empowering, empowering to understand that I didn't need to be a slave to it. I didn't need to be ashamed of it, that I could, I could still be me and people would still like me, even though I had that story. You know, you know? we just had um, someone else on uh, last week. She um, was, is uh, a victim of, of 
human trafficking. Mm. And thank God has come out the other side as well. But yeah. she was saying, once she started sharing her story and being really honest with herself and the world, she was also saying that was one of the most therapeutic, yep. empowering yeah. things for her as well. Yeah, I think there's there's so much shame. Yeah. You know, or so many stigmas that surround these kind of things. And so um, it can really, you know, it holds us back from being our authentic selves. And I think the more that we embrace that and say, yeah, you know, I lived through that. I survived it. Um, but despite that, I can thrive, you know. Um, and then putting it out there in a way um, that this, you know, I, I think this is, is what a big turning point for me was understanding that that helps other people. Mm -hmm. It helps support other people. It helps create a base of support for them. And, you know, that element of peer support is so powerful. And that's something that, that a therapist can't provide, that pharmaceuticals can't provide, that no other traditional treatment modality provides. Peer support is so unique in that way. And, you know, so understanding that I had power just in my story to be able to give other people what I was missing for so long um, was, was very powerful. Um, and, and, you know, and as I started sharing my story more and then doing so, so more publicly, um, it just naturally, you know, people started to, to gravitate toward mm -hmm. it, you know. And so on Facebook in particular, um, this was uh, around about, 2007, this, um, like, I just went from like, you know, a few hundred friends on Facebook to suddenly, you know, within um, a year or so, like almost 5,000 friends oh, on wow. Facebook. Just from this group? Just from this group and then from starting to share my story. Um, so, you know, that's when I, I really had the idea for No Stigmas and I decided to, to give it a name. Mm -hmm. um, so actually our first, No Stigma's first Facebook page was originally my personal profile that oh, I geez. converted into a Which page. Which now you know, like, don't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but. It, but it worked well, um, you know, because then we had this, you know, this community that was built in um, that grew from there, yeah. you know. Um, so it was, uh, it was the beginning of, you know, what's now um, a community of over 75,000 people. Wow. So, so you started that back in, back then, 2007? That's 2000? when I had the idea for it, mm. right? Um, it wasn't until 2011 that I got my stuff together enough to actually like, you know, create an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that I, I really can't take credit for. It's mostly like, I found some great people with lots of brains and, connections to lawyers that <laughs> that helped, well, yeah. you know, put the articles of incorporation yeah, and, yeah. you know, all of that, f doing all the filing and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, 2011 was really when, um, when, you know, kind of this, this collective group was like, this is something more than just, you know, than just like a, a Facebook peer support group, you know. Um, I recognized that there was, there was a real gap in services, you know, where, traditional mental health services left off, um, you know, because there's, so there's this, you know, group of people who, you know, live with severe mental illness, right? And who perhaps are hospitalized or, um, you know, extremely like live with like chronic suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. things of that mm -hmm. nature. Um, you know, so there's, there's systems in place for those people. Um, now a lot of people fall through the cracks, of course, and you know, that's, um, where a lot of our homeless population comes from. That's a lot of where a, a many of our incarcerated population come from is from people with severe mental health issues that fall through the cracks. Um, but, you know, and then we have, you know, very high functioning people who, um, you know, perhaps have a little anxiety or, you know, live with, you know, something like maybe seasonal affective disorder, mm -hmm. but generally they, they get along pretty well, um, are able to hold down jobs and have families and that sort of thing. Um, and then, in between, there's the majority of us, mm -hmm. right? People who um, deal with, you know, mental health issues in in a more of a, a chronic way, right, an ongoing way. And um, so there, there just there wasn't really a lot for those people. And you know, outside of pharmaceuticals or 
talk to a counselor, you mm -hmm. know. So that's I, I saw really a, a need for that, and that's the the place where you know no stigmas seeks to really you know help people be a conduit to other wellness modalities like peer support, like holistic approaches to mental health um, outside of those traditional ones. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe, and two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.